Okay, a lot of this we've already touched on, this global ecology or phenomenon which occur, which affect really ecosystems ac across the globe. But we're going to touch on them again, specifically global warming um, and El Nino. So the atmosphere um, is a layer of air that surrounds the Earth. The further away you get from the Earth, the thinner and thinner it is. But our atmosphere at the Earth's surface is approximately 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and then a small percentage of uh, various other gases, including almost 1% argon, a 0.003% carbon dioxide, and then even a much smaller percentage of ozone. Um, now, these different gases have different effects on the atmosphere itself. Um, some of them have a display a um, phenomenon called the greenhouse effect. I'm sure you've all heard about this, greenhouse gases. So what happens is heat is trapped near the Earth's surface by uh, greenhouse gases, which include water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, and carbon fluorocarbons. Um, they absorb infrared heat and then re-emit it, most of it, back to the Earth. Some of it scatters back out to space. So 30% of solar energy is reflected back by clouds or particulate matter, such as, you know, ash from uh, volcanoes and such. And 70% of it is absorbed by the atmosphere and the surface. So here's a good figure showing, you know, a lot of it can be reflected by clouds or it can even be reflected by things at the surface. Um, and um, some of it is even reflected and then reabsorbed by water vapor or greenhouse gases. And those greenhouse gases then in turn emit the heat back down to the earth. So if you increase greenhouse gases, the theory is that you're going to increase temperature. Now there is some, a lot of evidence to support this. Um, we've looked at the atmospheric composition of different gases over uh, the past 160,000 years by looking at ice core temperatures. So in ice, as it freezes, it traps little particles of air and we can look at the composition of that air to determine what the historic composition of air was. Um, the core indicates that two very large fluctuations occurred in carbon dioxide concentrations 140,000 and 13,000 years ago. And the temperature can also be inferred. <sighs> and you can see that the, the temperature and the carbon dioxide seem to be very highly correlated with each other. So our fossil fuels has, um, the burning of fossil, fossil fuel has increased significantly the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, up from 35,000, um, I don't know what TGs are, but 35,000 of the, 3,500 of those to 5,600. So close to a third, maybe half more. 50% more, um, and has continued to increase. There have been three major periods of interruption, World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II, where we've seen a flatlining of carbon dioxide emissions due to a reduce, reduction in economic activity. Um, <clears throat> the ozone layer is kind of a success. I mean, still... There, there's a layer of ozone which is three oxygens uh, bound together. Um, in 1985, British Antarctic Survey discovered a major hole or reduction in the ozone in the atmosphere. And ozone is important for um, reducing the amount of, of damage sunlight can do by basically reducing the effects of, uh, in, not infrared, but... Um, the UV light. So what was causing this appeared to be the emission of chlorofluorocarbons which were found in aerosols um, and in a protocol a meeting in Montreal in 1987 uh, a bunch of nations decided they were going to take steps to reduce the emissions of chlorofluorocarbons um, and this has had a direct effect on this whole 
and the largest it became was in the year 2000. In 2003, we, sh we saw the first evidence of the ozone layer recovering and it reducing in size. So this should come at the end, I accidentally copied and pasted up here. But our impacts of global climate change include shifts in biodiversity and widespread extinction. So if we're shifting the temperature faster than species can adapt, then they will start to go extinct. Um, forests have um, died, have, have been pushed um, you know, more northern or more higher in latitude and elevation worldwide. Ocean acidification, which is the increase of carbon dioxide being absorbed into the ocean and thus causing the ocean to be more um, acidic. This affects the organisms which are dependent on calcium, which is a positive ion and um, a basic ion. So increasing acidification decreases the ability to form these calcium products which form the shells of many bivalves and other mollusks. Um, you also increase temperature, you increase humidity, increase um, the fluctuation and in, in, um, flow of water. So you disrupt the hydrological cycle when you increase the temperature as well. And this can lead to more insect transmitted tropical diseases going up into temperate areas. So uh, case in point is the recently discovered Zika virus. And then the sea, li sea levels and climate have also been shown to cease as or shift as the polar ice caps melt. You're going to have an increase in sea level, a decrease in shoreline. All right, so El Nino again then is a an appearance of warm water which occurs in the Pacific Ocean near the um, western shores of these northern countries, Peru and Colombia. Generally during Christmas time, which is why it's referred to as El Nino, which means the child. Um, and the southern oscillation means it, it fluctuates between having warm and cool waters in this area. So the um, kind of history to this, Walker in 1924 discovered this correspondence between barometric pressure and Pacific and rainfall during monsoons. And he found that the southern oscillation was showed this change in barometric pressure and a decrease in pressure in the eastern ocean and, and vice versa. It showed this kind of seven year pattern. It's often associated with droughts in Australia, India, and Indonesia and parts of Africa and also suggested that winter temperatures in Canada were connected. So he showed really how global climates change or global weather patterns claimed changed with this shift in um, water temperature across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, UCLA professor connected El Nino and Walker's Southern Oscillation um, by proposing that a gradient in these sea surface temperatures produce large-scale atmospheric circulation. Um, with the changing of these uh, surface temperatures of water, you have also a disruption in the flow of air. So air mass flows westward, gathers more moisture as it warms, and the westward air eventually joins rising air in the western Pacific, which causes precipitation events. And what happens is during El Nino years, during the mature phase, um, the sea surface in eastern tropical Pacific is much warmer on average and the barometric pressure over the eastern Pacific is lower than average. This causes the promotion of storms across much of the United States. So these areas become, these areas over here become uh, a lot more wet than usual. And then these areas up here um, are become more warm and war more dry. So during El Nino, the sea surface in the Western Pacific is cooler than average and barometric pressure is higher than average and this produces drought over Western Pacific. La Nina are, are periods of lower sea surface temperatures and higher than average pressure in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. This causes the opposite, drought 
to much of North America and higher than average precipitation in the Western Pacific. So you have this kind of flipped phenomenon called La Nina. Under average conditions, the coastal waters are relatively cool, which um, as we know, cooler waters are more nutrient rich and allows for upwelling of nutrients along the um, Pacific coast of South America. But during the mature phase, you have much more warm water in there, and so you don't have the circling, cycling of nutrients, you don't have the upwelling, and you don't have um, as much phytoplankton production, which eventually results in reproductive failure in organisms that rely on those phytoplankton, uh, migration of other organisms, and or death. So here's an example of, of how El Nino will affect a population looking at kangaroo populations in Australia. The red kangaroo occupies most of Australia's semi-arid interior, so it has you know, generally a dry climate. During wet periods, it has plenty of food, and females will have a baby in the pouch and also another baby ready um, to replace that one as soon as it is old enough to leave the pouch. Under marginal conditions during El Nino, when you don't have as much wet periods, the uh, young will die soon after leaving the pouch. And if food becomes too scarce, the females stop lactating altogether and the young die in the embryonic stage, so they don't even get to the joey stage. Okay, so these weather patterns affect the abundance of nutrients and um, the ability of, phyto, of photosynthesis to take place in both marine and terrestrial environments, and it has cascade effects up and down trophic levels. All right, so there's also a uh, fluctuation in the nitrogen cycle. Okay, so nitrogen flows mostly through the ability of nitrogen-fixing bacteria and things like lightning to capture the nitrogen in the air and convert it into forms which can be used into organisms. But we have um, developed ways to do this by running currents through the air and causing then ammonia, um, which is a usable form of nitrogen, to be formed. And so naturally we have 100, you know, 200 and about 50 um, uh, TGs per year. Again, I don't know what that unit is. Um, but we have added an additional 100, up to 145 units of nitrogen to the environment. And this can have devastating effects, including what is called eutrophication, which we mentioned in class before. So this is where runoff from nutrient-rich fertilizers will empty into lakes and streams or oceans. The phytoplankton then has this increase in nutrients and thus um, ma rapidly reproduces and creates what's called a bloom. When they rapidly uh, reproduce, they're going to cover the top layer of water. They're also going to suck all the oxygen out of the air, uh, out of the water, and so it reduces the ability of other organisms to have access to sunlight and oxygen and nutrients, and they will um, die. So you have an increase in biomass in the phytoplankton, but a decrease in the overall biomass of of other organisms. All right, another global phenomenon which is occurring is the deforestation of tropical rainforests. Rainforests uh, support a lot of the biodiversity of the earth, at least half of it. And Skoll and Tucker reported that tropical forests in 73 countries covered approximately 11,610,360,000 square kilometers. Brazil contains about a third of those, and they also have the highest deforest deforestation rate. Estimated that about 78,000 kilometers square kilometers were deforested in 1978, and this increased um, from 1978 to 1988 um, of 15,000 kilometers square kilometers per year. So that's a lot. 
Um, so eighteen, so over ten years, that's one hundred fifty thousand, um, or one percent, about one percent of the total original square kilometers of tropical rainforest. Well, this has a significant effect, like we talked about today, edge effects. You're, if you deforest, you're creating more edge, and you're going to fragment forests into smaller patches. And when a forest is fragmented um, or isolated due to cutting, its edge is exposed um, not only to edge species, but also to wind and rain and, and sunlight, which it otherwise would be protected against by having this larger mass. So the physical environment along these forests edge is hotter, drier, and the solar intensity is too high for natural conditions to occur. So fragmentation decreases the diversity of plant and animal groups and their ability to disperse, which we discussed in class today too.